Well, good morning. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, something that the Lord has just recently laid on my heart, and um, it's very foundational in a lot of uh, churches today, and it's really not a foundation of truth, but it's a foundation that I see as a foundation of, of something that's not true, and in much of the church and it's a uh, I believe it's a foundation that is is and will be shaken and will come down uh, when it's all over with but uh, a lot of uh, of this foundation that I'm talking about is the foundation of how people have actually uh, viewed the cross how they've seen the the cross understood the cross See, it's not just about the cross, you know, it's about really what you understand about the cross, how you see the cross, really what went down at the cross. And uh, for instance, many feel and believe that in order for God to accept and receive us, that he had to forsake Jesus. He had to forsake Jesus in order to accept us. There's an old song, it's a um, great tune, and uh, not all the lyrics are bad, Amazing Love, um, that starts out with, um, um, I'm accepted because he was rejected. I'm forsaken because he was rejected. I'm, um, I'm forgiven because Jesus was condemned. That's how the song goes. I'm forgiven because Jesus was condemned. I'm accepted because Jesus was forsaken. And uh, so, you know, the sad thing about that, most Christians actually believe a, uh, a theology like that, that God actually forsook Jesus at the cross. And... Um, that God actually condemned Jesus. And uh, the sad thing is a lot of uh, grace ministers preach this same kind of gospel. A lot of people in grace that, that say they're no longer under legalism, and but they're under the grace of God. They still have a wrong view of God. <laughs> they still have a wrong view of the cross. And because of that, they haven't really come to really know the depths of God's love and they haven't really come to experience the freedom uh, of the Lord that uh, Christ has called us to walk in. They haven't been uh, experiencing and, and living in the reign of life. A lot of relief, maybe. Living in a lot of relief. And the relief is this, that they're relieved that God's no longer angry with them because he forsook Jesus. And... Um, the, the problem with that belief is that God has never been angry with you. It's never been sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's always been really the lost ones that God has always loved in the arms of a loving father. Remember God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not, not that God was so angry at our behavior that he had to send his son to Jesus to save us from him, from his own anger. Many of these things I'm talking about today are because of a, a if you want to call it a doctrine or a way of believing called penal substitution. And uh, I just want to look at something here. First of all, I want to look at because, you know, someone asked me about, do you believe in penal substitution? It, and it was almost like, um, if you do, or if you don't believe in it, then we're going to have to just break relationship together. If you don't believe that God was angry at Jesus and condemned Jesus so that he could accept and forgive us, then uh, we have to part ways. <laughs> and, and that's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. Because um, when they ask the question, do you believe in penal substitution, 
I honestly, and this was a few years ago, I I wasn't even sure what that was. Uh, because number one, I was never raised up in religion, thank the Lord for that, or indoctrinated through all of these things. Nor did I go to seminary to learn all this uh, belief systems that I was uh, supposed to be instructed to believe. But, I, you know, I looked up the word penal substitution. And uh, <clears throat> this is it, the definition, right out of Google, okay? It says this, penal substitution declares that Christ voluntarily submitted, submitting to God the Father's plan, saying it was the Father's plan, was punished in the place of sinners, that Jesus was punished in the place of sinners, thus satisfying the demands of a just God. So God can then truly forgive us for our sins and even love us, making us one with him. This uh, doctrine of penal substitution began with the German Reformation under the leadership of Martin Luther and continued to develop within the Calvinist tradition as a specific understanding of substitutionary atonement. Calvin. Did you know Calvin was a lawyer? So everything that, that Calvin, or I won't say everything, but a lot of Calvin's views and what he filtered everything through as far as his understanding was through that lawyer mindset, that legal lawyer mindset. Um, courtroom, lawyer, defender, prosecutor, attorney, that kind of mindset. And so there's a problem with that, and that is God is not, he's not uh, uh, an angry God in black robes in a in, in a courtroom with a big gavel demanding that um, somebody be punished for their bad behavior. I don't know if you understand this or not, but God is not a, the punisher. He's, the Bible says that God is love. He's not the punisher. First of all, we need to understand, you know, where, when Adam, you know, believed the, the wisdom of the serpent, the lie of the serpent um, over the truth, something changed. But it wasn't God that changed. God has always been who God has always been, and that's love. No, what changed was the image of God in Adam's heart, in his, in his, in his heart, in his eyes. The image of God, the face of God changed in Adam's heart until now, Adam doesn't see a God of love. He sees a God that's angry and a God that is um, out for vengeance and out that to punish, that he needs to punish or see someone pay or be punished in order to relieve him from his anger. But the truth is far better than that. God has always been love. God's never been angry with us. Uh, God has never changed. Our behavior, man's behavior, isn't so powerful that it can change the nature of God. But Calvinist, so Calvinist, it started with Martin Luther, penal substitution. Calvinist jumped on the bandwagon. And it says the penal model teaches that substitutionary, the substitutionary nature of Jesus' death is understood in the sense of of substitutionary fulfillment of legal demands for the offenses of sin. Now, I want to read something that that came across and as a morning devotion from one of the largest, most known, well-known grace preachers. He doesn't live in this country, and I'm not going to say what his name is, and I'm not despising him at all because I've seen how God has worked mildly through him in so many ways and brought so many 
into uh, places of understanding and seeing uh, and freedom, okay, to where they were actually bound at one time and blind and, and just full of condemnation. And so I'm not despising all these the teachings of this person and, and, and God has, has used him mightily, but I just want to read what, I, what he had to say during a mo- morning devotion because his foundation, someone that's well known in grace and, preach, and preaches a righteousness and grace, okay, still has the foundation of this penal substitution airy kind of thought. And it's not good. And it says this in the, in the devotion. Beloved, Jesus, your substitute, paid the debt you could not pay on the cross. Okay? He bore the sins of your entire life. God put it all on Jesus, and then he punished. Now, here's the kicker. He put it all on Jesus, and then he punished. God punished Jesus for every single one of those sins. Sins here, uh, they're obviously interpreting sins as behavior, bad behavior. So God punished, he put all our bad behavior on Jesus. He punished Jesus for that bad behavior. And then once he saw that he was fully, uh, that he was fully punished for every sin he was then fully satisfied (laughs) God was fully satisfied after he saw Jesus fully punished for all of our sins and it says and because he was so pleased with what Jesus had done that's when he raised him from the dead this is the devotion today Jesus tomb remains empty he is not there for He has risen, yes, and I say amen to that. His resurrection and empty tomb will forever be our assurance that we have been fully fully justified. Amen to that, but justified from what? See, they don't understand what we've been justified from. They believe or teach that we've been justified from all of our bad behaviors. And then he says, so you no longer have to be afraid of God. We don't longer have to be afraid of God. Judging us for our sins or our bad behavior. His justice is on your side. So, what about that? Did God punish Jesus? So, he wouldn't have to punish us. The truth is much better. The truth is much better. Remember the Bible says that God so loved the world (laughs) that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish. Perish means to just perish, not experience eternal life. That they would not perish but have everlasting life. So the motivation for God was never angry anger that he had to have his anger relieved by punishing his son his whole motivation God from the beginning and still because why because God is love he's not moody he's not even in a bad mood okay it's always been love and his love for us and God wasn't punishing sins our behavior okay by punishing Jesus what God was doing it says that that sin which is singular and by the way sin is not a a verb it's not an action here it's a noun it's a thing that man had come into union with through Adam you can read all about it in Romans uh, 5 how that that sin came into the world through Adam and that sin and then death through sin began to reign over all of mankind so God listen it was never about bad behavior it was about man coming into this thing called sin this coming into union with and what 
Romans 6 calls it the old man. Okay, the old man of sin, union. It was, it was, and I tell people this, it wasn't really about bad behavior as it was about a bad union, a bad marriage. And Jesus, when you understand forgiveness, if you look up the word forgive, it actually means one of the root meanings of forgive is to be divorced from. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? They even say that in, in the in the uh, Jewish culture if um, a man wanted to be divorced from from his wife he would come home and he would tell her I forgive you <laughs> in other words pack your bags in other words he the forgiveness even in the in that language was a word of divorce and what Jesus came to do was to divorce us from our union with that with the old man in Adam so that we could be then joined married to him who was raised from the dead so what it's all been about, about is not the behavior thing bad behavior is just the fruit of what we were in union with and it was uh, it's the fruit of a wrong belief system and a wrong union and a darkness that came into man came over man until man uh, really was it's almost like he was just totally out of his his mind blind isn't that what Jesus says he that he came to open up the eyes of the blind to set the captive free he wasn't just talking about physical blind. He was talking about the spiritually blind. But we came into union with, with sin and, and death began to reign in man. And we were so blind to God that we didn't know who God was. So guess what? We invented our own God. <clears throat> a God of judgment. A God of anger. A God that needed to see someone pay and punished so that he could be relieved of his anger so that he could love us well listen Jesus didn't come to save us from God it's not what the Bible says it doesn't say that Jesus came to save us from an angry God it says that Jesus and his name is called Jesus for he will save his people from their sin he came to save us from sin not an angry, angry God so who is his people? We is his people. We all his people. Remember, for God so loved the world, he loves all of us. Yes, even the, even those, uh, those just worst of the worst. <laughs> and didn't Jesus demonstrate that when he came? And what? He was a friend of sinner. He was a friend of sinners. And he came to declare the Father. He came to, to show us the Father because we were blind to God. We were blind to God, who God was because of sin and darkness. So Jesus did not come to save us from an angry God. But from sin that was filling us with deception and with death. Listen, we were all taken captive by sin and death through the lie and the wisdom of the serpent. But God so loved us that he came for us. He saw us taken captive by this sin and death. And, and God was who loved us so much wasn't going to just stand to just let that happen. The one he loved to just be consumed by this sin and death. So he's, he put a promise in place. He says, I'm coming for you. And how many know the Bible is really all about the promise of God to rescue us, to save us, all through Scripture? In fact, Jesus says, in the volume of the book, it's written of me to do your will. So from Genesis all the way through, it's always been about Jesus who would come and save us from this thing called sin and death. So did Jesus, was Jesus condemned by the Father? This is what penal substitution 
tells us, penal substitution tells us that God had to be relieved from his, his just anger towards us. And that God had to see someone punish so that he would be free from his anger, from his own anger, like God needs anger management classes or something. So that God would could love us and not punish us. <laughs> I mean, even when I'm talking about this, I just have to laugh a little because I can't believe that maybe even a few years ago, I even kind of had a tendency to believe that because that's what everyone else believed. But I was also a little bit confused about the whole thing because what it does is creates a dualistic God. A God who is love, but a God that has to punish us. Okay? It's just like, there's like two faces of God. It creates a dualistic type of God. The truth is better than penal substitution. The truth is that we were taken captive through one man, Adam. We all became in union with this thing called sin and death. And because of this sin, we were looking for life and love in all the wrong places because the sin created a, a darkness in us that was almost like a, a, the worst kind of dimension you could ever, dementia you could ever uh, think of like a spiritual Alzheimer's, okay? Our minds would became so dark that even uh, death look, began to look like life to us. So what did Jesus do? He entered into our darkness. The word became flesh. He came for us. Not to relieve God from his anger, but to satisfy God, to satisfy God's love to be reconciled back to him. That's why Jesus came. And it doesn't say that, that God punished Jesus or condemned Jesus on the cross in order to have his ang anger relieved from him. Now Romans 8, 3 says that sin, listen again, the problem was sin and death, not man. It says that sin was condemned in the body of Jesus. I wish some preachers would just pick up their Bible and read it for what it says. Sin was condemned in the body of Jesus. Now in Hebrews 10, I think it's Hebrews 10, it, Jesus even said, a body you have prepared for me to take away the first and to raise up the last. What did he take away? What was taken away in the body of Jesus? John said it. Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Okay. What was condemned in the body of Jesus? Sin was condemned in the body of Jesus. It wasn't that God had to see man punished in order to be relieved. He saw that we were in union with sin and death. And so he was coming against sin to take away sin. Guess what? Mission accomplished. Jesus has come. He has, he provided a body. It says, a body you have prepared for me to take away. Take away what? The sin. You could say the old man, the old, our old union with, with sin and death, to take it away so that we could then be married, joined to him who was raised from the dead. So what's the justification all about? The justification, it was this. It was unjust for us who were created in the image and likeness of God to be joined with sin and death. That was unjust. So what was the just thing? The just thing was to divorce us from sin and death, join us with Jesus who was raised from the dead, so that we could be filled with the fullness of God's life. That was the just and right thing. We were never created to bear the fruit of death, but to be filled with the fruit of the fullness of God's life. We were taken captive by sin and death. It wasn't anger that motivated God to send Jesus. Jesus didn't come to save us from an angry, angry God. I know one of the most famous messages of all time 
in Protestantism is sinners in the hands of an angry God. But that whole idea is from the pit of hell. That's all I got to say. It is not from God. It's not the wisdom of God. It was never sinners in the hands of an angry God. Did Jesus look like sinners in the hands of an angry God? Or was he a friend of sinners? And he was the expression of the Father. He came to declare the Father. So listen, if you have a view that's of, of, of God that's different than Jesus, because we behold right the glory the goodness of God in the face of Jesus if our view of God is different than Jesus and we see in Jesus then you've got the wrong view you might have a pharisaical view of God hmm who's the one that got angry with with Jesus because he was a friend of sinners because he loved people in the midst of their bad behavior who was offended at that? Who was angry with that? Hmm, I think it was the Pharisee. In fact, they're the same ones that crucified Jesus, nailed him to a cross because they did not have the right view of who God was. Their view was still born out of darkness, out of the carnal mind of Adam. When I start thinking about how, how this is uh, been twisted and how really the the truth is far better that's what I keep hearing the truth is far better than penal substitution the truth is far better it'll bring something in your heart that you've never experienced it'll birth something in your heart that you've never experienced before it, it'll birth a, a love a depth of the love that God has always had for us in your heart and you won't see God with like I hope he's still okay with me no, you'll see from the very beginning that God has been passionately in love with you and still is. But as I was thinking about that, I, and I don't promote movies, but I was thinking about the movie Taken, you know, with Liam Neeson in it, and how it really just paints such a picture of really what took place with those he loved and how that really God sprung into action to set those he loved who were taken to set them free from their captors and remember in the movie taken he he gave instruction to his daughter who wanted to go to Europe and to uh, with her friend to see Europe and she was a little young and and Liam Neeson he hesitated because he he knew the dangers of that of young girl going to Europe all alone so what did she do? There was a lust in her heart that wanted, insisted on wanting to go on this trip. So she lied to her father. And instead of listening to her father and obeying her father's and warnings and, and trying to listen to her father's wisdom and warning, she went ahead and went on this trip. And guess what? She was taken captive by sex traffickers. Okay, she was taken captive by some people that wanted to abuse her, sell her, and mistreat her. Well, guess what? When Leon Neeson uh, hears about what has happened with his daughter, he knows that she will be taken captive. In fact, he tells her, "If you, you are," he says, "You are going to be taken captive." Okay, but he tells the ones on the other uh, on the other end of the line that took her. I love this. <laughs> he tells them, "Listen, I have a special set of skills that make men like me a nightmare <laughs> for men like you." And he says, "I'm coming for you. Who is he coming for?" He was coming to take the captive, the one who took his daughter, the one he loved, and, and the one that, that, that he loved and, and took captive. He, he was coming for those to take them out, to crush their head, you could say. Remember in Genesis, he said, this, you will bruise the seed 
uh, the, the seeds heal, but the seed will then turn around and crush your head. He was coming to take the, her captors, captors out. And at the same time, of course, his main motivation was love. The love for his daughter. Okay? The love to, to um, rescue his daughter. To, to set her free from that which she had been taken captive by. Those who were abusing her. It's interesting, you know, that salvation... One word for salvation, if you look it up, is mol to be molested by an enemy. To be rescued from the molestation of an enemy, I should say. Salvation is to be rescued from the molestation of the enemy. And that's exactly what God did. He came to set us free from that which we had been taken captive by. I love it at the end when he finally takes all the enemy out and <clears throat> that last enemy that had his daughter in its grip and he takes him out and she looks at him with the eyes of love and says, you came for me. You came for me. And the father says, I told you I would. See, isn't the truth much better that it wasn't anger. It wasn't an angry God that had to see someone punished. Now it wasn't, listen, Liam Nelson, yeah, he was upset at his daughter that she believed a lie and was put in this kind of situation, right? Okay, but he didn't set out to punish the daughter. He came out to set her free from that which had been take uh, that which had taken her captive I wanted to tell that story because I, I really feel like it it paints a, a real true picture of really what went down why Jesus came and what really happened at the cross he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him we were reconciled it says the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing our sins to us. So we need to understand the truth because the truth is so much better. Again, it wasn't sin that was, it wasn't Jesus that was condemned. As the devotion says that once God punished Jesus, Okay, then he, and after he was, saw him fully punished for all of our bad behavior, he was then relieved from his anger and satisfied. No, it was sin that was condemned in the body of Jesus. It was sin. And through the, the death of, of Jesus and Jesus trusting the Father, stayed on the cross trusting the Father for life, until that which um, we had been taken captive by was fully put to death. He said, it's finished. And God raised him from the dead. Remember, it was the lamb that took away the sin of the world. Sin is not, we've always interpreted sin as behavior, actions, verb. But sin, most of the time when sin is written in the scripture, it's a noun. Look it up. It's a noun. It's a thing that we were taken captive by. It was a sin. It was a thing that was reigning in our heart that was causing death to reign in our life as well. And that was not acceptable to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God bless you.